worship on this Palm Sunday. I believe we might actually have a microphone that works through service today. So here's hoping. All right. My name is Pastor Sylvia Harris, and I'm so glad to see some faces I've seen several weeks and some faces I haven't seen in a while. It is wonderful to be here with you today. Can you hear the shouts this morning? Hosanna. Hosanna as they wave the palm branches as Jesus enters Jerusalem. We'll hear more about that when we get to the scripture reading this morning. First, a few announcements. As a reminder, we will have worship in person this Friday for Good Friday. It'll be at 12 noon here in person. And for those who watch us online, it will be online at six o'clock in the evening so that we can celebrate Good Friday. We are, uh, as another announcement, we are looking for volunteers to help with the ministries and administrative functions of the church. If you have the skills or expertise in something or want to try something new, please give the church a call. If you're a high school senior and still in need of volunteer hours, give us a call because we also have some remote opportunities available where you can earn those volunteer hours. The church's phone number, in case you don't have it, is 602-268-9461. You can leave a message and we'll get back in touch with you. And thank you in advance for prayerfully considering and responding to helping with the works and ministry of Wesley. This Sunday is, of course, the last Sunday in the month of March, which means that we are nearing the end of Women's History Month. And so I would like to invite forward at this time Mrs. Dorothy Mackey, to share with us uh, on that matter. Good morning, Wesley. Good morning. Good morning. Today marks the end of Women's History Month, and as such, I would like to highlight some of the contributions of women of color and the difference they have made in America. The abolitionists of slavery, the abolition of slavery, voting rights, and equal education for all, the end of segregation, African-American women have led the fight to ensure to cure many of the social injustices in American society. People such as Sojourner Truth, a powerful anti-slavery speaker, well known for her Ain't I a Woman speech, given at the 1851, in 1851 at the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio. Harriet Tubman, an escaped slave herself, conducted the Underground Railroad. She helped to rescue 300 people, and she made 19 trips back and recruited soldiers for the Army. Madam C.J. Walker, Madam C.J. Walker built her business on the products that she herself had made. They were mostly hair care products and cosmetics for black women. She employed thousands of black women also. She was the first made female self-made millionaire in America. Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin started and maintained clubs for African-American women and fought for slavery and edited a magazine. Ida B. Wells Barnett, a fervent advocate of equal education for African-Americans and one of the founders of the NAACP. Mary McLeod Bethune started her first school in 1904 with $1.50. Thomas Jefferson, 
Today it is known as the Thune Cookman University. Ella Baker was the co-founder of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and organized with Dr. King. Dorothy Height, president of the National Council of Negro Women, a position she held for 40 years and helped found the National Women's Political Caucus. Still in the political agenda, what about Angela Davis? Professor and the start, who started a movement with the Afro that we call the Fro, that we still cherish and wear to this day. Shirley Chisholm had the audacity to run for president. Rosa Parks sat, refusing to give up her seat to a white man. Her bet, she is better known as the mother of the civil rights movement. Coretta Scott King dedicated her life to human rights for all. Fannie Lou Hammer helped organize the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party that challenged the all-white delegation in 1964. And what about Billy Holiday? Who sang about those strange fruit? They represented black men who had been lynched hanging from trees. Then Mary Evers spoke out after the murder of her husband, Medgar. Marion Wright Edelman spoke out and founded the Children's Defense Fund to help children. Peggy Alexander, Diane Nash, were lunch counter sit-in protesters in the 1960s civil rights movement. Katherine Johnson, mathematician extraordinaire, the human computer, and a NASA employee whose calculations were critical to, to the success of the first and other crude flights of hidden figures fame. May Jameson, astronaut. Politicians like Barbara Jordan, the first black woman to give the keynote speech at a Democratic National Convention. What about Gwen Eiffel, commentator on her own show? In the field of entertainment, let's start with Marian Anderson, the first African-American invited to perform at the White House. She sang before 75,000 people at the Lincoln Memorial after being denied permission to perform at the Continental Hall. There are other great performers such as Bessie Smith, Hazel Scott, Sarah Bond, Ellen Fitzgerald, Pearl Bailey, Eartha Kitt, who was banned from working by J. Edgar Hoover for talking about the Vietnam War. And there's Rena Horn, Josephine Baker, Aretha Franklin, Leon Jim Price, Shirley Caesar, Nina Simone, Sister Rosetta Thaw, Catherine Dunham, who had the school for girls in Harlem, New York. Then we have younger performers such as Gladys Knight, Diana Ross, Patty LaBelle, Tina Turner. We can go on and on. Noble, all noble black women. In sports, Wilma Rudolph, Althea Gibson, Gabby Gifford, Serena and Vanessa Williams, Florence Griffith Joyner, known as Flojo, excelled in track and held and still remains the fastest woman runner of all times, whose record she set in 1988 and it has not been broken. Other black notables, Lorraine Hansberry, actress, Toni Morrison, Octavia Butler, Diane Carroll, Ruby Bridges, Eunice Johnson, all you Eunice Johnson, Ebony Magazine, that's where we went to look for all the latest fashions and hairdos, Eunice Johnson. Maya Angelou, poet and civil rights actress, wrote, I know why the Cape Bird sings. 
and was prominent in civil rights movement. She was an integral poet and read on the pulse of mourning at President Bill Clinton's inauguration. And then we have Amanda Gorman, the youngest inaugural poet, 22 years old. She read her poem, The Hill We Climb, at President Biden's inauguration this January the 20th. Then there's Michelle Obama, first lady, first black first lady, and Kamala Harris, first woman vice president of the United States of America. Younger frontliners, Oprah Winfrey, Gail King, Joy Reed, Samoan, Ruby Goldberg, Stacey Abrams, Bernie King, just to name a few. Okay, so what about Arizona? What, what have women done in Arizona? Who are some named people or important people that we know in Arizona who's made a difference? Well, what about Judge Jean Williams? She was the first female municipal judge in Phoenix and also served in Tucson. She was also a civil rights lawyer and was instrumental in helping to start a state Martin Luther King Jr. holiday right here in Arizona. What about Carolyn Laurie, children's advocate and founder of the first black United Fund, owner of Kids Place and Sisters Who Care, she had an office right there in Wesley, right over there. What about Eleanor Ragsdale, an educator and activist in the civil rights movement here in Phoenix? She was the wife of Lincoln Ragsdale, part owner of Ragsdale later Universal Funeral Home. And then we have Sandra Kennedy. She serves on the Corporation Com Committee. And of course, we have Leo Landrum Taylor. She was an Arizona senator and served in the Arizona legislature for 16 years. Oh, do we know her. She and her family served right here at Wesley. We, can, we lay claim to her. <laughs> okay, and then what about the food in Arizona? Uh, we do eat, and do we remember Mrs. White's Soul Food Restaurant and Bev's Kitchen? And what about our current chief of police, Jerry Williams? In the news media, we have Linda Williams of Town 10 and Susan Castro on Sonora Living. And then we have Charles Delaney's United Academy of Beauty, the first beauty school specializing in all types of hair in the state of Arizona. So let's remember our theme for Women's History Month. All of them are valiant women. All of women that try to vote and refusing to be silenced. This is our theme for this year. Thank you. Thank you for that. What a wonderful reminder of the numerous women that have helped to shape the history. And now I would invite BJ Forward to join me in this morning's call to worship. Oh, give thanks to our God who is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. For Christ has opened the gates of righteousness that we may enter. He has emptied himself for love of us. Christ took human form that we might know we are known. Holy One, you are our God. And we give thanks to you. We give thanks to our God who is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Our opening prayer holy brother you have come in god's name and for our sake you have entered our souls in moments of shouted hosannas and waving cloaks and you have come just the same to our late nights and our confused hearts 
Come to us again, dear one, and let us follow you. Let your name be on our tongues and in our hearts. Amen. First scripture reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? You say, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it back here. They went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. Some of the bystanders were saying to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them permission. They brought the colt to Jesus and put their coats on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their coats in the road, and others spread leafy branches, which they had cut from the fields. Those who were in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple, and after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve since it was already late. Our next reading is from the book of John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. Jesus enters Jerusalem. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. And all God's children say, and thanks be to God. Would you please join me in a moment of prayer? God of promise, we come before you today asking that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all the hearts and minds that hear my voice be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone are our rock, our Redeemer, and our Sustainer. Amen. Amen. As we heard this morning, Mark records the shouts from the crowd as, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor, David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. 
John, on the other hand, writes, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. We call today Palm Sunday, and yet only the Gospel of John says that the people took palm branches when going out to meet Jesus as he came into Jerusalem on that day. John's Gospel is also different because it has Jesus finding his own donkey, while the other three Gospels are like Mark's, Jesus sending two disciples to find a colt or young donkey while uh, in, yeah, for him to ride into the city. And so as often is the case with the gospel narratives, the story that they share is the same but different. And so we could spend this morning picking apart the differences, poking holes in the narrative, or we could take the time to see the fullness of the picture that is gained when we blend these perspectives with what we know about the historical events that would happen at the time of Passover in Jerusalem. Preaching on Palm Sunday, worshiping on Palm Sunday, brings us this sense of hope, right? This hope for a new future, a new beginning. The scriptures reveal a faith in God's deliverance that is evident by the crowds that have gathered, joining Jesus in this entry into Jerusalem. In the Gospel of John, if you've read just before this, Jesus has just finished raising Lazarus from the dead before this grand entry. So his power has been made clear. He can raise the dead, right? He can overthrow this Roman rule. Hosanna! Hosanna means save us, save us. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us, King of Israel. The people are speaking of the hope realized in this man coming before them as Jesus rides on a donkey. At the time that they see this entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, they see this as the point of salvation that they have been so desperately waiting for from generation to generation since the time of the exile. Finally, they have a leader in the line of David who is going to release them from captivity. What none of the gospel accounts tell us is about the parade that was happening for Pilate as he entered Jerusalem, as he came for the Passover festival. Pilate was the appointed governor for the city of Jerusalem, but he did not actually live in the city itself. So he would travel from his seaside home in Caesarea, which is about 80 miles away, and would have this great military parade as he came in a week before the Passover. He would display the strength and power of the empire at this time of holy festival. His parade was a reminder of the rule of Roman authority over the city. It was a parade that demonstrated the might of the empire and reminded the Jewish people they weren't to act up during the festivities. The parade for Pilate would have included hundreds of soldiers, legions of chariots, clear military power on display as they carried their swords and their spears into the city. Rome was flexing its muscles and keeping the con conquered people in their place as subjected, less than human, not even citizens. Contrast that, if you will, with the parade of a single man on a borrowed donkey coming in through the back gate. I don't know about your experiences with parades, but I can tell you based on my own experiences, and I'm sure my children's experiences, the parade described for Jesus pales in comparison to what that military parade for Pilate looked like. Can you see those contrasting images? Now here are the words of the Jewish people once more. The people who had just seen Lazarus raised from the dead. 
who had seen the miracles and heard the teachings of Jesus. Hear the words the Jewish people were shouting, Save us! Save us! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. They are shouting, crying out to be saved by the King of Israel, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They are not calling Jesus Lord. Instead, they say he is coming in the name of the Lord as the King of Israel. This less than grand parade is not the entry of the Messiah, of the Christ. It is the parade for the King of Israel, the human being who is in the line of David, Jesus, the son of the carpenter. When we read these passages, when we tell the story of Palm Sunday, we do it knowing the end. It's why John's account that we heard read ends with, the, with John writing, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. No matter how hard we may try, my friends, we cannot read the Bible the narrative that tells us about God's work in the world. We cannot read it without the lens of Christ's sacrifice, of the resurrection, of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it. But I want us to try for just a moment to put ourselves into the minds of the people that day. They saw the entry of Jesus through the lens of their current oppression. And they expected this larger-than-life miracle, this overthrow of Roman rule. They wanted an immediate end to their suffering through a military coup. The scene set in Mark's Gospel starts at the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives was the place where the people of Israel believed that God's eschatological, it's a big word, but they believe that's where God's final victory was going to come from, the Mount of Olives. And so the journey at hand clearly indicates that this is the time for Yahweh's final victory. The realization of every piece of hope for salvation is now at hand. The obvious next event that's going to happen is going to be the raising of armies and the realization of the revelation of God's chosen people. When you contrast these two parades, military might and a man on a donkey, how else was Jesus on a donkey going to overcome the might of empire? The only reasonable answer is to raise a larger army. What else could they have imagined? Israel was seeking justice, which is something that we are still doing today. When we go to God seeking justice, seeking help with the many injustices that we face in the world, what do we imagine happening? Do we see large sweeping changes like the sudden arrival of an army large enough to overcome the Roman Empire, the strength and the might of the Roman Empire, which had never been seen before. Do we see an army big enough to tackle the injustices of the world today in that same way? Do we imagine immediate change in the awareness and attitude about systemic racism, where people suddenly decide they want to dismantle those systems? bringing immediate relief from the chokehold that is on so many lives today? Do we expect that there's going to suddenly be no more food insecurities, 
where people are able to have access to affordable, healthy, sustainable food in the United States or in the middle of an impoverished, struggling nation plagued with doubt, fire, or disease? When we seek justice for our migrant brothers and sisters, do we envision a suddenly open border with welcoming accommodations that keep all families together as they seek ways to simply live? Perhaps when we go to God seeking justice for women and girls, we think that suddenly all patriarchal and misogynistic constructs around the world, all of those things that even exist in our nation, will suddenly be seen in truth and that we will have established true equality for half of the population, suddenly recognizing that the fullness of the Imago Dei is in a little girl. There are other concerns. The number of injustices I could name off go on and on. But what do we expect when we go to God seeking help to overcome these things? Do we expect larger than life, miraculous, sweeping changes? And just as importantly, if those sweeping changes don't happen, what do we do next? When the parades of Palm Sunday are over, when the celebrations and the revelry of the day is done, what did the people do? When Jesus gets to the temple, looks around, and returns to the town of Bethany, with his 12 apostles, what did they do? Before they even have a chance to look back and remember everything in the light of the resurrection, how do they respond to God in the week ahead? How do they respond when that hoped for army does not show up? The injustice is going to remain Rome is not going to be overthrown, and we know what happens. They abandoned Jesus. They ignored the signs they saw on Palm Sunday. They turned their backs on the wonders and miracles that Jesus had done, forgetting even the power shown in the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And instead, they throw their lot in with Rome. If you can't beat them, join them. It's not too far after those shouts of save us that they turn to cries of crucify him. Crucify him. The people declared Jesus king, saying that he was coming in the name of of the Lord. He was the weighted ancestor of David, the king of Israel. And even when those are the charges that he faces, the king of the Jews, they turn him over to Pilate for death. Instead of saving the one who worked miracles, the one who raised the dead, the one that they had declared their own king, by the time the week is over, they choose to free Barabbas, someone who the Gospels tell us was a notorious prisoner, a bandit, who was in prison for committing murder during the insurrection. Rather than choosing Jesus, the one who brought life when he resurrected Lazarus, the people free Barabbas, the one who took life in a murderous rebellion. How did the people want their injustices handled? Clearly, not like Jesus. They didn't want a king riding on a donkey who would heal the ear of the soldier sent to arrest him. They wanted their injustices handled through death, 
through aggression, through ways which made sense in the world, not through life, not through healing, through the way of love that is beyond our comprehension. While there are several possible reasons we could talk about for their fickleness, one thing remains abundantly clear. They fail to realize the truth of Jesus' identity, the fullness of God in human form. They saw the miracles, the life giving and the raising of Lazarus. They heard the wisdom of the teachings, but somehow they missed the part of the Messiah. Maybe it was there to some extent. I mean, they started at the Mount of Olives, but the fullness of who was in their midst was just beyond their grasp. Maybe it's because it's only in the light of the resurrection that we can understand it. It's only in the pouring out of the Holy Spirit where we can feel the significance of the echoes in our heart and our soul that speak the truth. For whatever reason, we have an advantage, my friends, that we can see the truth in a way that the people in Jerusalem did not. The truth of Jesus the Christ. And it is in this knowledge, as we look ahead to the crucifixion this week, that time when we see the absolute worst of humanity, the worst of the injustices and horrors that we commit against one another. Crucifixion stands as one of the most horrific acts of human beings. I don't have the time today to explore all of what that experience of crucifixion entailed, but suffice it to say that it stands as a humiliating and painful way to be killed. Stripped, naked, hanging for hours while you slowly suffocate, posed publicly for all to see. Bodies left as warnings, hanging outside of cities as they decomposed and were picked apart by birds. As a people who had prided themselves on being civilized, Rome used the most uncivilized way to kill people they deemed criminals. The one who came to give life and give it abundantly has his life taken and taken horrifically. So I'll ask you again, when you seek justice, when you seek relief from the many forms of injustice that we know exist in this world, what do you expect God to do? And if those larger than life expectations, those miraculous sweeping changes of events are not realized, what do you do next? Do you abandon the efforts of justice, leaving them to the murderous ways of humanity, killing them on the cross like Jesus? When events and circumstances don't change, when the system of oppression tightens its hold, going so far as to make giving people waiting in line to vote water an illegal action, if you didn't know that, Georgia just passed it. You can't give people waiting in line water or food while they wait to vote in the state of Georgia now. When the system tightens, tightens its hold, saying protesting may become illegal in the state of Arizona. Protesting, illegal. When children can be separated from their parents as they migrate into this country, simply as it's a great deterrent to separate. What do you do when the system continues to pay females less than males for the same amount of work? Or what about the laws and the customs that say child brides are okay? Do you say, like the people of Jerusalem, if you can't beat them, 
join them, or at least ignore it? Do you turn against seeking justice? Do you turn against those who perhaps have failed to enact change fast enough? In essence, crucifying their efforts? Or do we act like the women and the disciple who, loved Jesus, who Jesus loved, standing by the cross while Jesus' humility and humanity is stripped away? Do we stand by those who are oppressed, those who are so often overlooked or ignored? Do we stand with those who are told time and time again they are just not worth as much as others? Do we choose to be the ordinary people doing extraordinary acts of kindness, acts of solitude, acts which are seemingly small but still making change? God's justice was not swept in 2,000 years ago by Jesus, the King of Israel. It was not swept in by him raising an army to defeat the Roman Empire. God's justice today will not be swept in by an extraordinary, miraculous act, short of the second coming, my friends. God's justice, God's kingdom on earth, will only be realized when we stand with the oppressed, when we stand with the marginalized, when we stand with our siblings, no matter who they are, or what they look like, or where they're from, and we take the small steps to create change. Supporting grassroots efforts and initiatives, like a microloan program that is for women-owned businesses in Africa, which in essence fights poverty and patriarchy there, and a number of other injustices. When we partner with initiatives that teach people to fish through providing education on agriculture or animal husbandry as ways for sustainable food. When we see the injustices of our government and we raise our collective voices to our representatives to say we will not tolerate abuse and brutality by those sworn to protect and serve. When we support initiatives of accountability and transparency. When we seek to understand why people risk their lives to travel hundreds, even thousands of miles and face the possible rejection to just cross a border. When we actively choose to see the Imago Dei, the image of God in all of humanity, we are taking steps to fight injustices and to honor the voices shouting, Hosanna, save us. Stand at the foot of the cross this week. Keep your eyes and your ears open as you see and hear the absolute ugliness, the ugliest aspect of humanity. Witness what it means to be dead in sin, enslaved to death. Hear the fading echoes of the Palm Sunday crowd as God acts according to God's will, not according to human will. And then ask yourself, how can I best respond? How can I best answer the voices of the world today that are still crying out, save us? Do not jump to Easter Sunday. My friends, take the time this week to mourn the evils of humanity. To mourn the death of God and to sit in the darkness of Holy Saturday. We've been walking towards the cross for several weeks now, and this week we arrive at the crucifixion.
take the time to see it, to honor it for what it is, the darkest parts of who we are, of who God sees and loves and forgives anyway. Amen. Amen. Would you please join me in prayer? God of abundant love and mercy, we come before you this day as witnesses to the horrors of humanity, the horrors of ongoing gun violence, violence which makes no logical sense as mass shootings are returning to our nation. Even as we celebrate the reopening of businesses and activities from a year of closure due to the pandemic, even as we celebrate, it seems another epidemic is once again on the rise. The epidemic, epidemic of senseless hate and violence. Lord, we ask your mercies on those who struggle to understand their anger, their depression, their isolation, we know that you can bring healing and peace and justice to this land. And Lord, we ask for you to do that now through us. We pray for those people in Boulder who lost loved ones this week, Lord. May you comfort them. Just as much, Lord, we pray for your guidance in this nation. That our leaders may come to reasonable solutions to these senseless acts of violence. We pray for the ability to see one another in truth as human beings, rather than adversaries, rather than enemies. Help us to work together for solutions instead of ripping one another apart in attempts to gain more. Lord, we confess that we are sick sick in the ways that we seek to hoard more resources, more money, more land, more power, more control, more of whatever it is that someone else wants or has. We are people plagued by the unending appetites and desires, plagued by covetous hearts, Lord. Forgive us, we pray. Help us instead that we may see the infinite nature of you, of your grace, of your love. Help us to be examples of what it means to be holy in this world. Lord, we pray that we are able to see the small ways of justice, the small actions of healing, the small places of hope. We know that in those small things, you are doing big things. Just like with the two fish and five loaves, we know that you can multiply our efforts, multiply our blessings, multiply our abilities in this world so that great things can be born. Lord, we ask for your multiplying efforts to be birthed into our lives now. Father, there are prayers now weighing heavily in our hearts, and we lift those those concerns that plague us, we lift them to you both aloud and silently now. In your mercy, hear our prayers. As we pray together the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
sometimes, every time, it causes me to tremble. Tremble, tremble. This week, don't rush to Easter. Take the time. Be aware. And as you go, go knowing God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, go with you always. Amen. Amen.